with the downfall of Tsarist Russia and the rise of communism. Any of us who studied any history at all knows that's exactly how World War I took place. Then World War II was fomented between the Zionists, uh, between the German nationalists again, and the Brits to bring us in. And in World War II, Israel was to be born. And the Zionists were given power. So since the first two wars came off, just exactly as that letter said, and that letter used to hang right in the British Museum Library until 1977 when Baron Rothschild became a director. And as soon as he was on the board of directors, that letter disappeared from the library. Immediately. But since that letter so clearly delineated the first two world wars, I think we have to look at it seriously and take it to heart when it says in there so clearly that the third world war will be fomented between the Zionists and Islam. Does anybody see that materializing today? Every place we look, we can see it happening. And we can see that the power they have here in this country to run things and to pull the nastiest little scams, and America believes it. Because they don't realize who it is that owns the newspapers. They don't realize who it is that owns the television. And sometimes they don't care. As long as there's going to be football on the Monday night and I got beer at hand, that's all that counts. Well, at least for a lot of people. And I think once they find that they have let their children and their grandchildren slip into tyranny, they may regret it. But regrets never come at the beginning. They always come at the end. We can see World War III shaping up just exactly like they planned for us. And not enough of us are doing what's necessary to stop it. Look at all the empty seats we have here. America should be flooded to this cause. They should be interested in what is transpiring. They should be interested in who's doing what and to whom. It was right after World War I that J.P. Morgan was given the job of gaining control of the newspapers. They knew they must be able to control human thought with input. And if you can realize that the human mind is a whole lot like a computer, the old garbage in, garbage out effect takes place. If you can control what people hear and see, then you can pretty much control what they think. And they were able to utilize newspapers and now radio and television for just exactly that purpose. Now, there were 78 newspapers, major ones, that they really needed to get control of, but J.P. Morgan thought if they got 25 of them, that would be enough to control things, but it wasn't. They realized soon afterwards that they had to get all of those newspapers under their control. And we got the likes of guys like David Rockefeller who announced that he wanted to thank the people of the Washington Post and the New York Times for respecting their pledges of discretion at the CFR and Bilderberger meetings. And he said if it wasn't for their discretion, it would not have been possible to prepare the world for a new world order. Oh, we heard George Bush say that a lot, didn't we? George Bush Sr. 
He was always talking about New World Order. When he went into Iraq, he said, this is much more than about one small country. This is about a big idea, about a new world order. There's a lot of people don't even know that on the back of their dollar bill where they see that all-seeing eye of the pyramid, what that means. They don't realize that's occult symbolism that was put in by these Satanists during the Roosevelt administration by his vice president, a guy by the name of Wallace. They don't speak Latin, so they don't realize that Inuit Coepidus up at the top says announcing our enterprise. They don't realize down at the bottom of the pyramid where it says Novus Ordo Seclorum, what they're talking about is Novus is new, Ordo is order, Seclorum is world, the entire world minus God. So we're talking about a new world order without God. We have little time left. So much of what they've done has been implemented, and we can see that they were able to do a lot of this through fractional reserve banking. That was accomplished several times. We had central banks here in America, even when they weren't supposed to be, when the people were against them. Oh, they never dared to call it a central bank. But essentially, that's what it was. The, for, the War of 1812 was fought just because people weren't going to have a central bank. But by 1816, at the Treaty of Ghent, we had another central bank here in America. Through this fractional reserves, they are able to change prosperity and poverty. It's all done through the discount. Uh, if you lower the price that you lend to the member banks, they can in turn lower the price that they lend to their banks, who in turn can lower the price that they lend to people. And if it's low enough, people are going to go out there and borrow money and use it and get themselves trapped, not realizing how badly they are pinned in. Because all it takes is a little change on that lever and they start taking money out of the system. And when they take the money out of the system, it becomes sluggish. Just like you, if somebody took one-third of the blood out of your body, it would affect you. Well, that's what happened here. They told us that the Great Depression was brought on by people who were investing in the stock market on a shoestring. And because they had only 10% down, they had great marginal swings uh, caused by the leverage of that debt. But the real truth of the matter is, the thing that really brought it down was they removed one-third of the money from circulation. So with that lever, they can move things up and down, up and down, and this goes up, people run out, oh, prosperity is here, let me jump in on the bandwagon and get my fair share, and about the time they do, about the time they think they're leveraged up and ready to roll so they're going to make some money with their new business, all they got to do is lever it back down. And then they go in and collect through forfeiture. Do you know how many homes are being scooped up by the banks right now? I think it's so close to the end policy, the end time game here, that some of these smaller bankers are going to find out that they're getting pinched in this thing too. See, it's only the fattest of the fat cats that they really intend to have survive and prosper. They're trying to wipe out the whole middle class. I don't feel like I'm middle class anymore. I feel like I have been reduced to the impoverished. Life is not the same as it used to be. We just do not have the same kind of po prosperity that we once had. And if they can have their way, and I see no reason why people in authority with as much power and leverage as they've got, it's going to be difficult to stop them from having their way. We're all going to be reduced to abject penury. Life where you, bring up, you won't have 
you won't have two nickels to rub together. You may have a whole pocket full of million dollar bills to rub together, but they won't buy anything. Now, after World War I, they had this big conference in which they brought together all the people involved in the war to have a settlement and a signing of the armistice with Germany. On one side of the table was Paul Warburg. On the other side of the table was his brother Max Warburg. In total there were 117 of these false Jews, as I prefer to call them. And we would not know about this except one of the guys there, a guy by the name of Benjamin Friedman, who was the bag man for Henry Morgenthau Sr. He became a Christian. And he decided he could not live with the secrets that he held. And he started talking about what had transpired, what the real game plan was, who was involved in it, and what their plans were for our future. An unseemly pl plan for our future. Much of that was done with these what you call false flag operations. A false flag operation is where you go in and pretend to be somebody else, do something wrong, so that the people that you attack think, hey, it was those people that did it to me when it really wasn't those people that did it to you. We find that a whole lot of that is done by these false Jews. For example, the Lusitania was sunk to start World War I. Now Germany had taken out advertisements in the New York newspapers and said very specifically that they were carrying munitions aboard that Lusitania. Don't, write, don't go on it. Well, while they were doing that, they ended up sending off some of that ships and with 100, well, 128 American passengers aboard it. And it wasn't Germany, it was Great Britain that sunk that ship to suck us into that war. They, they were having trouble. See, Germany was already winning. And they didn't like the idea at all. And so these characters went over to the King of England and said to the King of England, now, you don't have to surrender to Germany. If we can bring America in on your side, if we can cause America to start fighting your battles for you, would you support a homeland in Palestine for us. And the king of England was, what do I do? Uh, do I surrender or do I agree to let somebody else have that home? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll support that. So in November of 1917, the king of England sent a letter called the Balfour Declaration to Lord Rothschild, whom he called the most eminent Jew. I think he should have called him the most eminent false Jew because the real Jewish people have absolutely nothing to do with this new world order, this aggrandizement of power and the passion to dominate others. This is all among these Khazar warriors that only pretended to embrace Judaism in 741 AD. We find that as time went on, that we run across some of these things that these characters have done. And it was in May of 1919 at Dusseldorf, Germany, that the Allied forces obtained a copy of the Communists' Rules of Revolution. Now, you've got to remember that communism was their front, too. When we find out the names of some of these characters, you realize, yes, this web is 